Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Accessibility in Tech meetup tonight. Um, we'll have a presentation made by three companies, Microsoft, Faber Novel, and Caros. But before that, let's welcome Christophe Desproges, our um, Head of Disability Initiatives at Microsoft. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Christophe Deproche. I work in Microsoft as a program manager. I'm also in charge of the Employee Resource Group for Disability in the company. All right, what are the goals of accessibility? As you think what an accessibility journey might look like, the first question many people would ask is what exactly is accessibility? It can mean different things to different people. When some, some people think of accessibility, they think about designing buildings, structures with accessibility in mind. Others may think it's only about ensuring uh, that we're following ex uh, accessibility compliance standards, for instance. But you might also think about digital accessibility, ensuring that people connected to other people and information, and that ensuring that those people have got the, the right user interfaces that are customizable and adapted to their needs. But at the end of the day, accessibility is about enabling people to achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. It's about letting people fully participate and contribute. Ultimately, it's creating experiences that are better for everyone. And AI can add a layer to personalize to each person's individual needs. At Microsoft, when we look ahead, we see tremendous possibility here with AI. AI is the ability to change what's possible for people with disabilities. So if in the past you had to adapt to the world, in the future you will adapt, we will adapt, sorry, in the future the world will adapt to your individual needs and preferences. Now obviously we hold difference in human beings. Some people do have what we call a permanent disability, sometimes from birth. Some people have what we call a temporary disability. So just imagine you go skiing and you break your right arm and you're right-handed. You'll be in a disab disab disabled situation at some stage. We also talk about what we call situational disability. Uh, if you remember, for instance, during the first confinement in particular, we were working with our kids at home. That is obviously not a disab disability as such, but it was debilitating and it was you know, difficult for all of us. Now, if we look at the different forms of disability in particular, I'm going, we're going to look at four buckets here. Physical disability, so obviously mobility issues, sensory disability issues, like vision, hearing impaired people, deaf people, intellectual disability with mental illness, and cognitive disability with what we call also neurodiversity, like people on the autistic spectrum, for instance, or these troubles like dyslexia, dysautographia, and so on. Now, a few figures here to show that accessibility is a responsibility for all of us. Over 1 billion people in the world have some type of disability, and many of those folks have techno need techn technological assistance. And let's face it, only one out of 10 have access to the necessary tools today. Unemployment rate for people with disability is twice as big as people without disability. And let's remember something extremely important. Disability can affect us at any time. It can be a car accident, it can be aging as well. Now, in France in particular, roughly 12 million people have some type of disability. 80% of this visibility are what we call non-visible. So this is very important to understand. Over 5 million people, like myself, have hearing disability or deaf, or are actually deaf. And if we look at the overall population of France, for instance, that is aging, we expect obviously this population to grow. Roughly 3.5 million people with reduced mobility, roughly 650,000 in wheelchairs. And something also that is increasing also is 700 million, sorry, 700,000 people with mental disability, which is obviously getting worse and worse. And in terms of um, vision, roughly two people, two million people uh, are affected with visual disability. So this is obviously going to increase with the aging of the population once again. Now, let's not forget, we are in the corporate environment today, but accessibility as such is a society issue. 
There is there are implications at work, at school, and at home as well. Now, I did mention a few minutes ago, accessibility is a responsibility, but it's also a fantastic opportunity for us. There was a study in 2018 made by Accenture, Handicap, Handicap Inn, and the American Association of People with Disabilities. That was really, really interesting. Accessibility as such is a differentiator for companies. And if we bear in mind that 75% of the population in 2025, so this is coming very rapidly now, pick values that reflect their value. For, for this generation in particular, DNI, diversity and inclusion, and accessibility are differentiators to join those companies. Now let's imagine accessibility for those companies, 28% more revenue for companies that are being inclusive twice as higher profits as well, and 30% results on profit margins in particular. Now, this is Satya Nadella, our CEO, and when he, he came a few years ago, he created a mission for all of us. Our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more through innovation, artificial intelligence, corporate social responsibility, diversity and inclusion policies, and trustworthy computers, computing. Now, in, at Microsoft, we have fantastic accessible products and services for everyone. If we look only at the employee digital environments in particular, we've got some fantastic operating systems like Windows 10 or Windows 11 that was released recently. Uh, that is with a lot of um, accessibility feature in the ease of access uh, settings in particular. We also have some Fantastic Office 365 or productivity platform again with a lot of accessibility features. My favorite is the accessibility checker that will help you to identify what is not accessible in your documents and will help you to fix them as well. Use, we also have some fantastic applications. The one that is incredible is Seeing AI that was actually created by some employee, Microsoft employee a few years ago at some hackathon that will help people with uh, it, um, vision disability to read basically thanks to the phone. Um, we also have Teams, uh, which is a fantastic collaboration platform with a lot of built-in accessibility features as well. Now, if we think more broadly in terms of application development in particular, we have a fantastic tool called Accessibility Insights that will help you identify and, and rectify and or fix um, what is not accessible in your apps and on your in your in your sites as well. Fantastic power platform with accessibility local applications, Azure, as we, we mentioned it uh, early on as well, and something that is very important to us nowadays, which is inclusive design. In the past, we used to create products, ship products, and then sit all together, trying to figure out what, how we could make things more accessible. First of all, it was much more time consuming, more expensive. Today, what we do is we include people with different types of the, the disability from the very first minute of the production of the products to ensure that everything is being accessible. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this meetup on accessibility in tech. Uh, we first do a quick introduction of who we are, what is AI Builder, and then we'll have some uh, best practices on accessibility. As we go through the examples, we'll cover also some useful resources that we use internally uh, to make our product accessible. So my name is Matthias van Linger. I'm a design manager at Microsoft. Uh, I've been working there for the past 13 years now, mostly designing Windows apps. Uh, I started with the music apps, the movies and TV apps, uh, then the reading app. Uh, and lastly, I've been working on AI Builder for the past three years, where I serve as a design lead. Now we'll let uh, Chateau introduce himself. So my name is Chateau Namalgama. I've been working at Microsoft for as a software engineer for around four years now, and I'm the Dev Accessibility Champion on AI Builder. Speaking of which, what is AI Builder? So AI Builder is a website that enables uh, non-technical people to build and use AI models without any prior knowledge of data science or software engineering. 
there are some models that are uh, pre-trained for you so that you can kind of use out of the box. Or otherwise, if you need to have an AI model that is uh, tailored to your business needs, then you can build your own in a user-friendly way. Here's a quick overview of the different capabilities we offer. I won't go through all of them, don't worry, uh, but we can basically divide them into four categories. Models that are based around documents. Imagine you have a PDF file and you want to automatically extract data from it. Uh, models that are based on raw text. Uh, these are a bit more diverse. Think uh, text translation, sentiment analysis, et cetera. And then we also have models that are image-based. Uh, let's say you want to detect objects within a picture or classify them. And finally, we have uh, predictive models that where you can predict an outcome based on historical data. Now enough about AI yeah, Builder, let's get back to accessibility. So going through all the best practices to make your product accessible would be too long. So instead we'll be looking at some key examples. But before jumping into the examples, I want to share some, uh, I want to talk about WCAG. As you may know, our mission at Microsoft is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And by every person, we include people with disabilities. Uh, this is why at Microsoft, we decided to make all our web experiences WCAG 2.1 compliant. So if you're not familiar with WCAG, uh, it stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, it's an international initiative created by the W3C uh, that, uh, that, yeah, to make the web more accessible for people with disabilities. While it's mostly for web, uh, there are still really good resources around uh, application, desktop applications, mobile applications. So I highly encourage you to double check their content. All right, so the first best practice I want to share with you is around motion. Motion is used more and more in applications and website, but we often forget that motion can be distracting and even cause motion sickness. Um, yes, for people with uh, vestibular disorder. Here we have an example of a carousel in AI Builder. Uh, by default, the carousel auto plays. Um, as the animation can be distracting and the text hard to read, we decided to add a play pause icon next to the uh, carousel controls to allow our customers to pause uh, the carousel. On top of that, we also made the carousel fully accessible for our keyboard users, uh, so they are able to navigate uh, within that uh, dialogue uh, freely. Our second uh, best practice I want to share is around color contrast between the text foreground color and the background color. Uh, that includes text on images, icons, uh, maps, diagrams, and more. As you can see here, uh, the, the recommendation from WCAG is to have a 4.5 ratio uh, for standard text and 3, point, uh, 3 to 1 ratio uh, for large text and UI elements. From a design perspective, there are a ton, of, a ton of tools out there that you may want to use to double check your color contrast and ensure that your design is WCAG accessible. If you're using Figma, you may want to download the color contrast checker plugin developed by Microsoft. Uh, you just need to select a frame and then run the plugin. It will automatically highlight every text element and, and UI element uh, that doesn't meet the WCAG criteria. Uh, it's super easy to tweak. Then you just select the text or the UI element and adjust it with a slider to meet the, the, the right contrast ratio. Now, Shatara will show you additional tools you could use uh, from an engineering perspective to double check uh, color contrast. Here, I'll demonstrate how you can use the Edge and Chrome extension Accessibility Insights to check for color contrast issues on an example page. So as you can see, there's a good example and a bad one. The one on top has a good contrast between the text and its background, whereas the other one doesn't. By a single toggle of the button, the tool will check for issues on the whole page and automatically flag them for you. While this shows the color contrast issue, uh, the tool can automatically detect and catch a whole variety of accessibility issues. Accessibility Insights is also available for other platforms, so uh, Windows desktop apps and Android apps. Now, Matthias will talk about keyboard accessibility. Right, so the third best practice is around keyboard navigation and focus order. 
Uh, it's important to remember that unlike with a pointer, uh, mouse or touch, keyboard navigation is linear. So when implementing keyboard navigation, consider how your user will navigate within your site or application, and also consider the user's culture reading patterns. So in France, it will be top to bottom, left to right. Uh, here we have an example of a design spec highlighting the focus order to navigate within the dialog. So we first start with the pivots at the top, with uh, get started, examples, and best practices. Then if I tab, I will go to the carousel controls. Uh, tabbing again will go to the text field, then the create button, the cancel button, and finally the close uh, icon at the top right. If you want to create similar design, design specification for your engineering team, uh, I recommend this Figma plugin called Focus Under, uh, developed by Microsoft also. From an engineering perspective, there are also tools you could use to test the focus order uh, for your web content. For that, we recommend uh, to use the Accessibility Insight for Web Browser plugin. So here, we are looking at the iBuilder homepage with the plugin enabled. And as you can see, uh, it highlights every tab stops on the screen. Uh, one good practice is to ensure that, uh, especially here where we have 12 uh, tab stops in order to reach the main content, uh, one good practice is to have the, the, uh, a quick shortcut to the main content. So I just need to tap once and then press enter and then I will jump, my focus will jump to the main content. So now Shatara will show you additional improvements we made to our builder uh, for our keyboard users. So here I'll showcase an experience we have of tagging documents. As you can see, it's quite a visual experience, right? You have to be able to see uh, to tag the document. Now we'll try to tag the date that's below the previous invoice number uh, using the keyboard. You can use the tab key to navigate uh, through the UI, whereas to move through the numerous boxes in the document, uh, you can use the arrows. Once you've selected uh, a box, you can use shift plus arrows to resize your box and encapsulate all the necessary information. So here, not only the date, but also the day uh, and the year. Now, you might be wondering, why should we make accessible such a visual experience, right? You have to be able to see the document in order to tag it appropriately. To understand that, uh, you should keep in mind a couple of things. Uh, the first one is that all keyboard users aren't necessarily blind. Uh, this might come out of the blue, but this is actually a common excuse that I hear. And secondly, for the screen reader aspect, uh, which we didn't show here, but our experience is also screen reader accessible, people who are visually impaired, but can still see, might use a screen reader. Hopefully I've convinced you with those two arguments. And so now Matthias will talk about Reflow. The last best practice I want to share with you is around viewport sizes and browser zoom, also called Reflow criteria by WCAG. Users with low vision often increase uh, the text font size and the zoom and the browser zoom to better read and see content. WCAG recommends that your website should still be usable at 400% zoom and that you don't have uh, scrolls in multiple dimensions. All right, so one thing to note is that a 1280 pixel resolution zoom at 400% is equivalent to 320 pixel resolution. This is really handy if you design and build your website or application with responsive in mind. The only thing though is that when you design on mobile, you're thinking mostly about a portrait layout. And when you design on desktop, you're thinking about a, a, a landscape layout. And so uh, that could cause some uh, vertical spacing issue. And that's what we see here. So here we're looking at an AI Builder page before our latest change. While zooming on the, on the content, uh, everything reflow nicely. So we have the panel that becomes full, screens, full screen. Uh, uh, we only have a single scroll bar, but the main issue there is that the list become really small uh, and you're only able to scroll within that small list. So one way to fix it is to change the layout at 200% zoom. So, le, so the list has a fixed height and you scroll on the, on the entire panel. All right, so that was it for us. Thank you for listening, and now we'll welcome uh, Chaos.
Hello, uh, thanks for having us. I'm uh, Margot, product owner at Caros, and I'm glad to discuss with you our accessibility project. Uh, today, we will address the following topic, uh, how to make daily carpooling accessible to a person with reduced mobility. <coughs> so first, uh, Caros is a mobile carpooling platform which enables uh, passengers and drivers uh, to find a match to share their car rides. Our members use our application to save on their transportation costs, to make their commute nicer, and to reduce their carbon footprint. Now, after six years of activity, we count over 400,000 um, users in France. We started to develop in Europe uh, with Denmark this year, and we are making carpooling a mainstream mode of transport. We are confident uh, on the ecological impact of our service. And now we take time to see that our um, application is still not suited for everyone. Uh, and for example, person with disabilities. So uh, working on that uh, become a new goal for Chaos. And um, as it was said previously, <laughs> As it was said previously in uh, this meetup, accessibility is a responsibility uh, with 5.8% of the working population concerned. And it's also a growing demand from our customers, which are companies and public authorities. And finally, uh, our users are also expecting from us an accessibility journey. Um, you can see here are some examples, uh, some messages we received at our user support. If we read the first one together, uh, I have a disability and a walking distance of 100 meters. The proposals are always too far from my starting point or my ending point. And the other example um, are express the same things that uh, we have registers in the app uh, with disabilities and they would like to carpool, but they really need uh, to find carpoolers uh, which pick them up and drop them off as close as possible of their home um, and ideally not require them to walk at all. So all these sources, um, society, uh, customers and users uh, are making accessibility a great motivation for the team. The subject of accessibility, a great motivation. And about the team, uh, we just ran an hackathon recently to, collecti to collectively think about how to make our app more accessible and more inclusive. And one of the projects we chose unanimously was the one of the accessibility for person with reduced mobility. So to allow those person to carpool easily, uh, we have to solve two issues. The first one, of course, is how to uh, collect the information that a user has a disability. And our choice is to make it declarative and let people to declare uh, when registering on the app. And the second point is uh, how to use that information uh, when calculating opportunities. This is what we call the matching. And I leave the floor to Paul, our software engineer, uh, to explain you how it could work. Thank you, Margot. As shown in the animation, Matching users means finding an acceptable route along which a driver and a passenger can meet and split. This incurs a detour for the driver and a walk for the passenger. To find such a route, we first compute the area where the users can go to. The passenger by walking around his origin and destination points and the driver by making a detour along his original path. We call those move zones and we check whether their intersection provides a match. The colors of the squares uh, represent the combined efforts that the users consent to to get there. For uh, reduced mobility passengers, we limit their move zones to the smallest possible. For them, we also uh, disabled public transports and we increased their flexibility on departure time 
to compensate for the driver making a longer detour. Next, we reconstruct the full path for each user by finding optimal pickup and drop off points. Zooming on the lower part of the picture shows the driver finishing his journey after uh, shows each user finishing their journey after drop off. In the reduced mobility case, it is much easier as we don't need to find optimal points anymore. We simply add two stopovers to the driver's original path. The zoom shows the driver finishing his journey after dropping the passenger off at his respective destination. Here are a few metrics to study the impact of such a change. So uh, the first graph shows that the, in the reduced mobility case, uh, the, the average passenger walking time is greatly reduced as the passenger is, uh, meets the driver right outside his home and is dropped off at his destination. This leads to the second graph, uh, which shows that the average driver detour time is only increased by 1.6 minutes. This shows that including reduced mobility passengers still yields relevant carpooling opportunities. Back to you, Margot. Thank you. Um, to conclude, we would like to say that uh, Caros is a player in shared mobility, but uh, this term will take its full meaning for us uh, when our service will uh, be um, suitable for everyone, uh, including people with disabilities. And committing to more accessibility uh, is a win-win situation. As collaborators, we are proud of having uh, contributed to the project. Um, developments Paul presented to you are important and expected from our customers and our users. And finally, having more uh, carpoolers in the application uh, is a virtual sequel to boost the usage, uh, which is still our first ambition. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Edward Sigel. I'm engineering director at Fabian Oval. And welcome to Accessibility on Mobile. This is going to be a three point presentation, quick presentation of myself and the company I work at, a section about mobile constructors' efforts on accessibility, and last but not least, what is left to us, people creating an application to deliver an accessible one. So, Fabian Oval and myself. Farmer Novel is a company that's 18 years old. It houses 450 talents spread across three continents in nine offices. Its conviction is that technology can help build a better future. To do so, it gathers talents to invent, produce, code, or even teach in a tangible and tailored manner with and for our clients. Faber is to be daring enough to try new things while aiming at truly improving the world, thus the Novel. In practice, we develop various applications, not only mobile, we do digital strategy, learning expeditions, SEO, data, and so forth. Myself, I joined in early 2011 as a junior mobile developer, all the way up to my current position as engineering director. I've worked almost exclusively on mobile applications in fields such as media, health, and transport. For the past three years, I worked on the new RATP application. On a more personal level, I love fantasy, dancing, West Coast swing, video games, and mangas. That, that's out of the picture, let's dive in. So mobile built-in capabilities, disclaimer. So I'm more of an iOS than Android developer, which means I use iOS vocabulary, but almost everything I say transposes as is to Android. Constructors are committed, so what needs to be pointed out is that obviously mobile devices and their OSs heavily improved over the years. They are now almost 15 years old, which allowed for plenty of iterations. They cover a large panel of issues grouped in three categories, visual, audio, and motor impairment. For instance, voiceover and talkback tackle visual impairments. FaceTime allows for sign language in your calls. 
and voice control or alternative input can help people suffering from motor troubles. You can check all this and more in your accessibility settings menu or the links below. It is also interesting to note that some new features can improve accessibility by definition, such as Siri or FaceTime, while other will need extra development that the assistive touch to circumvent the use of 3D touch or force touch. This is the accessibility menu on iOS. It's pretty thick, plenty of entries, Android is comparable. So yeah, I would say constructors are doing their part or definitely trying to. Now, what about us? What are we doing our part and how heavy a burden is it? So obviously you have to do additional work if you want a better user experience for impaired people. A lot of this is quite similar with putting an accessible website in place. The design is expectedly the starting point of it with some known things today, such as color contrast or the need to duplicate feedback. Another example are screen readers, voiceover and talkback, which behave comparatively and have similar expectations on both platforms. Indeed, the order of element in the view hierarchy must be properly specified if unusual, and it also needs alternative text of the visual elements for a proper user experience. Let's have some quick examples. An example of a color contrast issue, which is obviously platform agnostic. And this showed the need to duplicate visual cues with a red colorblind example. This issue is platform agnostic too. Now regarding screen readers, that is the accessibility inspector, which can, which can be used on Mac to check for alternative text and the reading order of elements on the whole screen. It does take time to properly set and do quality control on this, but it is most necessary to ensure a proper voiceover experience. Now let's talk about dynamic type, which allows users to customize the size of the display text. It accommodates users who can read smaller text, which is neat, but it also caters to those needing an extra large text to properly read, thus helping visually impaired users. How does that work? You assign text types to elements instead of specific font size values, and then the system adjusts according to the user preferences. Like this would be a title, this would be a body, this would be a footnote and so forth. How is that a burden? Well, obviously assigning styles is easy, but the perfect mockup that you had may now need to be stretched and distorted to fit that bigger text. Either that, or you can have cropped text because you were expecting a single screen to be enough space. So please be aware of that and use scroll views as necessary. Basically, as soon as you have text displayed, just ensure that everything scales and resizes properly. That is, of course, less of a problem if you are already thorough with your internationalization, because then you know that some languages can take way more space and already accounted for that. A quick meta example with the uh, dynamic type entry of the accessibility menu. So smaller text, hardly ever an issue. And then you can have the perfect example for the need of a scroll view with the bigger text. So the, the thing is, with when you get the middle screen as a mockup, would you think that you need to use a scroll view? Maybe not, but it is obviously needed for the impaired user. So just Overall, accept that some of the custom components or layout that you did need to be able to be resized to some extreme cases to accommodate for visually impaired people. That ideal case mockup you received, that is not the real life, or at least not for everyone. Let's double down on customized components. Accessibility needs custom code too. So when you do non-native custom components, you will have to re-implement, overload, overwrite methods, what, and so forth. Well, don't forget that you probably need to do the same with accessibility-oriented methods too. For instance, you can set the relevant accessibility traits, you can use current accessibility containers, and so forth. Quick example with the RATP application. So this has a decent level of, of complexity with uh, three or four transparent full screen views, each with different controls and scrollable elements. That was a bit of a pain to customize only more so three years ago. That means that when we were finally done with the functionality, 
it was actually completely broken accessibility-wise. Notably, the reading order was all messed up. So we had to come back to it, fix it for fix it for it to make sense, queue back to the accessibility inspector from before, and test the increased burden. An example of containers or traits, the bookmarks, the blue squares. They need to be presented as a single focusable elements for a proper user experience. And that way you can have the voiceover, voiceover um, read something like home bookmark, two minutes travel time button, and maybe you even set the accessibility action hint, something like type to display the details of the trip. So that brings that gives a lot of context that could be inferred from the visual of the element, but that is not available to the visual impaired uh, user. And let's finish this presentation with the idea that you can even differentiate your, your UI for impaired people. You can detect when some of the accessible capabilities are used, like if your user uses voiceover. Well, if he does, let's read him that fleeting notification that he could otherwise miss. And overall, let's just react accordingly. If, is there a design that's easier to use when using voiceover or any other capability? Are there components that we should be more or less prone to use for such users? That is definitely a tough question. If not the views, what about the controls, the way to interact with them? They can be changed too, such as the use of specific finger gesture or controls that the, these users are comfortable with. For instance, for this drop-down menu with the picker, what if instead of having a button presenting a picker at the whole new view, what if instead we kept the focus on the element and from there we used finger, co finger control actions to directly change the value? That would use less view and change the focus less, reducing the risk of confusing the user. To me, it does sound better overall, but what do I know? I'm not impaired and acknowledging their needs doesn't mean my answer will suit them. So overall, it can be really hard to think about every special case and adaptation when it's not part of your everyday life. It's just the, the, to finish the presentation really takes this back home. The best way to show you care about the accessibility of your app, it still is to have it be thoroughly tested and collect feed, feedback from actual impaired users. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, everyone. Before we jump to the Q&A, I want to give a big thank you to all of our speakers tonight. So thank you to the speakers from Microsoft, Karas, and Faber Novel. Um, I also want to thank you who virtually listened to us, and uh, we're super grateful that you were here virtually with us. Um, finally, I want to give a big thank you to the team who organized this event. So thank you, Samia, Salim, Uda, Shao, and Rashid uh, for making this event possible. So I know we are all virtual, but let's give a big round of applause for all the speakers and all the team. So let's now jump to the Q&A. Uh, so I'll invite all of the speakers on stage and uh, yeah, we'll answer all of your questions. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, we're going to wait for the person to sit down. Uh, the first question that we have is for all the presenters. Uh, does disability pay off from a renewable point of view? It looks like a big engineering investment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, you heard the question. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. So the question is, um, from a revenue perspective, does the disability pay off uh, or accessibility actually pay off from a, an investment perspective? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I can give a, a few uh, pointers. Um, when I worked on the RTP application, there was, uh, they needed to put the emphasis on the accessibility because there are many, many applications that do the same thing. And um, even if to some people it would be um, only a few more users, uh, I would say every user counts. 
So when you want to take the top spot and be the, the main, like the application most used to, to do what you want to do, uh, that, would, that would make sense to cater to accessibility needing users. Yeah, and let's, let's remember something important as well. We're talking about 1 billion people in the world with some type of disability. And as I said early on, you know, in France, 80% is what we call invisible disability. So you never know whether the person is being impaired, you know, either vision impaired or um, whatever. Uh, so let's simply make products, you know, that are accessible for all of us. Um, and as I said, something very important, you know, you never know, you could be disabled at some stage with any type of accident or with aging as well. Um, so never assume that the person in front of you is not someone without disability. So it is still worth, you know, the investment. And remember, we're talking about 1 billion people. This is a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, the second question that we have is about accessibility bugs. So when you, when you invest in a feature, for example, that is uh, accessibility related, how do you decide the priorities for bugs that, you, that are incoming uh, for those features? Anyone? I can, I can take that one, although. So I, I won't be able to describe the whole process that we have at Microsoft, um, but basically we have an external team that is going to open some bugs uh, and they have basically a checklist that they go through um, and there is a severity that is um, associated to uh, those bugs and we try to uh, fix them uh, based on that priority. Uh, the next question is for Carlos. Do you have uh, some customer feedback to share after the accessibility feature to reduce mobility time in, uh, after it was released? Can you repeat the end slower, please? The end after you released the feature for uh, accessibility uh, and redu for reduced mobility for the users, did you get customer feedback? Uh, we didn't uh, produce the feature yet. Um, it's still a project. So um, I hope we will have soon. <laughs> We do collect uh, user feedback anyway, so we will. Let's do I have a second question for Carlos. Um, so do drivers get compensated for the additional uh, distance that they drive when uh, uh, carpooling with the uh, reduced mobility person? Okay. Um, so again, the future is not uh, produced, but uh, we thought a little about that. I think it will depend on the disabilities of the passenger, um, as Paul said. Uh, today, making those developments, those adjustments, uh, will not represent such an effort for the driver. So it can be like for him, for the driver, like a unusual carpool. But um, if the disability of the passengers ask him more, maybe. Um, uh, help the passenger to get into the car, uh, then yes, maybe we, we will think about uh, compensation or things like that, but uh, it's a projects and projection for now. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think it's for both Microsoft and Fibernovo. What are your thoughts on possible computer peripheral OEMs? Uh, involvement in making software more accessible? Are there emerging ideas on human machine interface or peripherals that would be more suitable to specific disabilities? Thinking of an example as Braille or textured screen mirror uh, that would highlight uh, general screen elements before announcing them on voice synthesis. I'm actually having a bit of trouble to uh, hear the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Did you hear it? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not the only one. Can you repeat a little bit uh, louder or slower, please? So what are your thoughts on possible computer peripheral OEMs involvement in making software more accessible? Are there emerging ideas on human machine interfaces or peripheral that 
uh, would be more suitable to specific disabilities. Um, as an example, you can think of Braille or texture screen mirror that would highlight general screen elements before announcing them on voice synthesis. I would say in terms of, of softwares, we, we by default on Windows, for example, we have a ton of uh, uh, um, features that allow to improve uh, the accessibility. Like we have high contrast by default, we have I don't know, you were mentioning additional stuff of ease of use. Yeah, in Windows in particular, we've got the ease of access. So there's um, a lot of different things uh, for vision impaired people, for, for uh, hearing impaired people. Um, early on, we were talking about colorblind people, for instance. In, in Windows, you just go into the settings, you click on one button, and all of a sudden, the person with, the, with colorblind can actually identify stuff on, on the screen. So there's plenty of stuff that we have in our products. I don't know what is going to happen in the future. Yeah, so I think the, the question was also more specifically hardware. on hardware. Yeah. And so for hardware, it's a bit more complicated, but Microsoft uh, does has does have, sorry. Um, so for an example of that is um, Xbox. So you have the Xbox controller uh, that most of us are used to, but uh, there is also a special one that uh, um, has like bigger buttons and uh, is more easy to use for people with uh, reduced mobility. Uh, so that's one example of a hardware that was developed at Microsoft. Yeah, it is the adaptive controller, exactly, right? Yeah. And that was, it's actually a very nice story because it was it was a father, you know, it, it, we created this for his kid and then there was a hackathon at Microsoft level and that ho that's how it started. Uh, so it was originally for, you know, for a kid and they expanded it and it's a huge success. And I know even people not using Xbox are using it somehow with other platforms as well. And it's a beautiful, um, it's actually beautiful itself. And even the packaging, I don't know whether you've ever seen the packaging, no. but it's actually made for people with disability because you just, there's a, a small thread, you, you take, you pull it here and it opens automatically and it's, it's very nice. And the tool itself is actually, there's a lot of um, work with other companies uh, with peripherals in particular uh, that are adaptable, so it's it's a beautiful tool. The the the, the thing your story points out is the um, what I said to you is that it's really hard to get have an idea on how to tackle uh, a disability because when when you're not suffering from it or when when you don't have a a close a close one or a kid or something that that uh, that is suffering from it, and that's so this is why I think. It often starts like this, like this, with one people wanting to do something nice for a close one, and from there it, he has a, a good idea, and then it, it, you know, rolls on, and you can then do a product and produce it and deliver it to other people that suffer from the same issue. And uh, oftentimes I've seen that it started with a hackathon, like you were mentioning earlier, the seeing AI which is something similar that allows blind people to see uh, thanks to AI, to see uh, objects around them. Uh, also seen recently, so we had an international hackathon like 10 days ago. Uh, I've seen one where uh, a father made a hand printed uh, mouse for their kids uh, because they have like uh, motor issues. And so it was, it was funny because they, they took the, the Microsoft Arc mouse and then hand printed uh, 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 or like work on something that allows them to change the, the, the shape of the mouse just with uh, uh, and printing it. So that was, uh, I mean, I think it's always start with like, um, I don't know, like a, a, a personal story that then eventually, yeah, then, then the person evangelize it. Uh, and yes, it seems like that's the way it works today. Yeah, that actually reminds me because we did a, a internal hackathon too recently. Uh, one of the team wanted to work on the depth per perception issue that um, I'm not sure, I think one out of 10 or something uh, people suffers from. And they used a VR headset and you have to like take a chicken and there is a, 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 um, a target and then you have to like drop the chicken on the target and this, this checks whether you have depth perception or not. So that's uh, an idea on how new hardware can help, uh, in this case, just help detect uh, uh, an issue that you wouldn't know you have. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, for Faber Novo. Uh, do you think it would have been easier to design the new RTP uh, app with accessibility in mind rather than fix accessibility bugs afterwards? Um, yeah, obviously, when it, like accessibility and localization and plenty of issues uh, or plenty of um, yeah issues when you when you focus on them from the beginning and you are thinking about them from the design, it, it's obviously um, easier. Um, it may it may um, it may mean that you would have uh, some um, you'd have some uh, problems that uh, you wouldn't have to cater to uh, w without them. But overall, it streamlines the process and the fact that you won't, you won't have to um, go back to it later, uh, like going back to the beginning and like having a, a full application and that's uh, functionally okay for regular people and then, oh no, it's not accessible, oh no, it's not localized, oh no, whatever. Just going back to the beginning and having to correct something, that costs a lot. That's something that we know because uh, fixing anything, fixing, fixing a bug when it's uh, just just as soon as you uh, wrote it, fixing it is totally uh, is really cheap. While fixing a bug at the end of the line, it's obviously way more expensive. And uh, working with anything and here accessibility obviously uh, is cheaper. If you want something accessible, it's obviously cheaper to do it from the beginning. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is the last question. Uh, it will be from Microsoft. You've touched on testing products uh, to make sure they are accessible. Do you employ people with disabilities to test your products? So, so uh, I would say around us, not, but we have a team in, in uh, Redmond where we work with. And so we designers are able to uh, come to them and share our, uh, our designs. And so, and even when it's implemented actually, or when you have a proto or POC, you can come to them and, and share what you have. And so they have, uh, it's a small group of folks with uh, people with uh, disabilities, including, uh, yes, uh, visual disabilities. And so it allows uh, us to get really, I mean, to get feedback from real people with disabilities really sooner which uh, allow us to really, I mean, to adjust then the, the, the design or the implementation, uh, which is great. But yeah, I mean, it's it's always hard to find uh, those kind of person and we're lucky enough to have a group of that, for, of, of uh, people to do that, so yeah. And we also have um, an important feedback mechanism in Microsoft, you know, in our tools and everything. Yeah. Uh, so we obviously have got lot, if you want to, you know, if you want to provide feedback to Microsoft, you go into the web, there's many opportunities and something that is very important as well. We've got a dedicated support from Microsoft called DAD, Disability and Desk. So they're here to support basically people with disability when they've got issues with, with their products. But at the same time, it also enables us to collect some feedback to then share with the product groups in particular and then redesign the products or improve the, the products at some stage. Yeah, also as uh, engineers, we all get those feedback. So, you know, it, it does go through the whole pipeline. All right, uh, on behalf of the organization, we would like to thank you uh, for attending this online event. Uh, you can uh, keep the discussion alive uh, in LinkedIn. Uh, we will be there to participate and help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.